This podcast has been brought to you by Cine.nl. This must you see. Will you please listen up to what I have to say? Cause we're in for some old fashioned wrestling today. Not the vile and oily opposer which kind, but the kind that involves tens of thumbs you will find. Cause it's thumb wrestling time. Yes, it's thumb wrestling time. Yes, it's thumb wrestling time. So we will discuss pros and cons, falls and pluses of all your favorite movies. And we will ponder the merits of cinema in this WrestleMania. Hello, pot people. Wow. That's from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You are listening to a brand new episode of Thumb Wrestling, the podcast in which I, Ruud Vos, speak to another guest. With another guest, we converse, actually, about a certain film about which we do not see eye to eye. And this is episode mid-90s. Episode Frankenstein 90. Hmm. This episode, I think, is going to be a real corker, and that has a lot to do with the fine guest who has joined us this time. Because joining us today is freelance voice actor, writer, and podcaster Chandler Bullock. An Amsterdam-based American who you might know from their Beauty of Horror podcast, which is to be found amongst other places on shockaholic.org. Chandler also writes for Morbidly Beautiful, the We Are Horror Zine, Zine? Zine? and Film Cred. And another reason why this is going to be good is that Chandler picked out a terrific title. Aliens, the 1986 movie by none other than the madman, James Cameron. We've talked Cameron before in the Titanic episode, we've talked Alien before in the Covenant episode, but never together. And not in English either. Um, In case you don't know the plot, Alan Ripley wakes up after the events of the original Alien film and six decades of hypersleep to find that the company holds her financially responsible for everything that transpired on the Nostromo and that the location of the original Alien crash site now holds a human settlement. And when the company loses contact with that settlement, they of course turn to Alan Ripley to ask, can you please come and fix things? Reluctantly, Ripley joins a fleet of marines to go search the site, only to find themselves knee-deep in xenomorph shit very quickly. Ripley has to keep her wits and be racist to an android to save a little girl, not be uh, dumbfounded by a company that clearly has bad intentions, and battle a new threat, the Alien Queen. But once most humans are dead and the Alien Queen is pushed out of an airlock, she can go back to hypersleep, but with a couple of new acquaintances. End of movie. Anyway, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get to it. My conversation with Chandler Bullock on Aliens. But first this. Show me the money. Hey, do you like this podcast? Well, this podcast likes you too. Just for listening to it. Even if you're a casual listener. But if you like to be liked, you can be liked even more by donating a small monthly sum of money to us on Patreon. And if you do, you get rewards to show you how much we like you. What am I saying? How much we love you. So visit patreon.com slash and get even more warm feelings. And even if you don't, no worries. Thank you simply for listening. Three, two, one, five. I think you'll find that even though I am generally very positive about aliens, I know there's plenty of stuff that I can be critical about as well. So Good. Most people cannot. (laughs) And that's the thing that bothers me the most about this movie. I can most definitely. (laughs) is Is that your opening statement? 
Mm. Might be. <laughs> <laughs> Might be. Do you want to get into that? Okay, so my mini review of Aliens is that this is a poignant tale about PTSD, motherhood, uh, maternal instincts, and a woman's journey of trying to discover what really matters to her in life in a movie that had no interest in being a movie from the Alien franchise whatsoever. (laughs) (laughs) So you you recognize the good bits, but they would be better if it wasn't an alien movie. Yeah, and the good bits as well, I think, hinge on the version of Aliens that you've seen, which is a problem. So I know that, you know, Cameron did write the thing that we all know about. Yeah. But let's face it, people, when they saw it in the cinemas, just saw oh, she's a woman, so she must care about a kid. Yeah. (laughs) Because they took out all the core bits that actually made the story matter. Well, there are two interesting things about that. Because a a part of the movie, Aliens, was stuff that uh, Cameron had already written for another project, I think called something with mothers. And then uh, once Walter Hill and the other guy said, hey, maybe we want to do a sequel to Alien. And... Cameron thought, I love Alien. It's my, one of my favorite movies. I want to do that. He put those ideas into this script. So that's mm. where that comes from. And the other thing about your criticism about interesting bits, but uh, not interest, uh, the, the, the comparison to the Alien franchise, that was basically also my argument when I uh, did the thumbs down to Alien Covenant, which I think is also ah. a very interesting movie. But it would be more interesting if it wasn't an alien prequel. Interesting. I don't know if I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole thing with the origins of the alien, which uh, Ridley Scott is very much interested in, were also the things that least interested me about that movie. The David yeah. stuff was way more interesting to me. Yeah, I do agree with that. The fact that they could have chosen how to show work with the history of these synthetics and their development and how they, they've you know changed over the, the multitude of years yeah. is very interesting to me. In fact, I think one big failing, if I know this is a different uh, movie we're talking about now, but like one big failing with like Prometheus and Covenant is as a prequel, it commits the same sin that I think Aliens commits as a sequel, which is just ignoring what other things in the franchise were doing yeah. and just doing their own thing. So then it's like, so you're showing us an Android that, is more advanced than the android that was in your your actual movie, your first one. Yeah. Beforehand, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's a shame. If that's like you know you're trying to build up to those sorts of things, but I agree with you. David was the the real heart and soul of those movies. Yeah, both of them. Both of them. Both Davids. Walter. <laughs> well, also both movies, also Prometheus and Covenant. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's not get into that too much. But with Aliens, no. I sort of agree with a lot of stuff there. And I think it's kind of telling that it's basically Cameron doing the same thing twice within the same number of years. Because he also wrote the script for uh, First Blood to Rambo. Uh where he takes some material that is dark and poignant and talks about existential stuff and turns it into B-movie schlock. Yes. Which isn't necessarily bad because it works in those terms. At least Aliens does. Rambo 2 I haven't seen for so long that I can't comment on that. (laughs) (laughs) But it does make you... Um, have to face aliens on its own term and not on an alien term to appreciate that bit of it. And once you start seeing it as an alien sequel, then I do agree with that. It sort of falls apart. That's the thing. And what bothers me a lot, now this is where we're getting into fan base, but there is a hyperbole amongst the fans of this property. And I think about a lot of franchises really that, you know, Public consensus is something that really is powerful. So if you have friends who feel a certain way or your parents told you a certain thing or you read that one review and you liked the way they wrote it, you may never watch that movie again and just go, oh, I agreed with it. So my whole life, I am now going to say that one thing that was said to me without really like 
watching it again and seeing where I might disagree with it. And yeah. people talk about Aliens as if it is a perfect sequel. And I just feel like it is one of the worst sequels I have ever seen <laughs> because it does so little to give a shit about the movie that came beforehand. I don't completely agree with that, but I see where you're coming from. Oh, yeah, I'd I'm say. being hyperbolic as well, yeah. I suppose. But I just, I, it was amazing to me. I always feel when I'm talking to people about it, I kind of tone it down. I'm like... I and I by the way if people love aliens I I think it's a fun movie there are yeah. a lot of good things to it I'm not going to tell people that you know I don't judge people for loving it I just get really frustrated when people want to talk to me about it being so perfect when I'm like I have a lot of grievances with this film just yeah. fundamentally too like even as a if it had been a standalone property, I may have laughed and chuckled and enjoyed it a little more. But even then, there are some of those Cameronisms to it that just yeah. kind of rub me the wrong way. <laughs> so just to make that clear, but it's amazing to me how I always convince myself that I'm just mildly irritated by one thing. And I watched it last night and I was like, I am so unhappy right now. <laughs> I was just so not enjoying this movie. Well, and I try so hard every time. I'm very happy that you were very much uh, not glad with watching Aliens last night because that does fuel your emotion today. That's good. It does. What was the first time that you watched it? And did you feel the same way? When I saw this movie for the first time. I think the first time I saw Aliens, I didn't feel much at all because I was very young. I think I saw it somewhere like on the sci-fi channel in like 1996 or something like that. Yeah. Um, so for one, didn't even get to see the full unedited version of it. You know, I grew up in the U.S., so we mm. edit movies on television. You cut them with like a million different uh, commercial breaks so that it can be a three hour movie instead of a one and a half hour movie. You yeah. know? Makes it really hard to watch as a child. I just remember being like, cool, it's scary. You know, if yeah. anything that had a lot of dark shadows and some creepy looking monsters was enough to make me go, this is impressive. Yeah. Uh, but when I saw it as an adult, I, I got the anthology on Blu-ray. Yeah. So we're talking like, what, like 2008, 2009, something like mm -hmm. that. And that is when I decided I'm going to watch all of them. I got all four right here. Let's watch yeah. these movies. I was blown away by Alien because that one always just gets me. It scares yeah. the hell out of me. It's such a powerful film. Yeah. And I got to say, Aliens makes the marathon experience quite quite interesting. Because uh, <laughs> that tonal shift, it kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, so it does hit me every time. Just because mm -hmm. I don't want more of the same necessarily. No. But there, I do feel that there are core aspects of H.R. Giger's work that's explored in Ridley Scott's film. Yeah. And just enough of this uh, base description of the entity itself mm -hmm. that this movie goes, who cares? Yeah. And that always just, it takes the wind out of my sails because I'm like, oh, well, I mean, you could do your action movie, but make them scary. Come on. <laughs> oh, it just disappoints me every time. <laughs> The the original has a lot of uh, uh, Lovecraftian uh, existential mm -hmm. horror, and um, what was it called? Like uh, f the universe being against you. Type yeah, it's shit. a cosmic horror film. Cosmic for sure. horror. That, yeah. Yeah. And Alien uh, it sort of it, it, it takes that existentialism and makes it like deep makes you deeply afraid to even exist, sort of. And then precisely. Aliens turns that sort of into a social commentary where Ellen Ripley at some point goes, well, maybe they're not so bad because at least they don't f uh, try to fuck each other over for a, a profit margin or a percentage. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a very Cameron thing to do, especially yes. with with uh, Avatar in hindsight. Oh, oh no! I had it in 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 twenty twenty sight as well. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I was so. Here's the thing. I, this is one of my grievances with Cameron. <laughs> I I do not mind activism in film. I am a very outspoken person. Anybody who follows me on the internet knows that I possibly tell my social political feelings a little too freely <laughs> in public. <laughs> uh, so I get where he's coming from. I love when a movie wants to do this, and I, I so. I will say props to him for daring to put a magnifying glass on this stuff, especially in the 80s when yeah. people weren't really even interested in seeing it. Yeah. But the way it's done, 
is so spoon fed to a mainstream audience that there's this kind of cynicism to it where I feel like the whole purpose gets lost because you still made this like McDonald's fast food version of the story that you're trying to tell. And so, then like, sort of it like, works for some yeah. things, but not all of them. And sort of like, yeah, let's get the the actor who most looks like a Weasley lizard, Paul Reiser, to, yeah. to be the company man. <laughs> What a company man he is, too. (laughs) I do love Burke in this movie. That is a wonderful character. (laughs) Why do you love him in this movie? Uh, Well, I mean, for one, Paul Reiser just does have the most punchable face from the 80s and the 90s. Like, (laughs) Mad About You is also just like, I remember watching that series and just thinking like, what a waspy douche like <laughs> the whole time. But he was a likable douche. And that's the thing. Paul Reiser, he's so good at getting your attention and he's got that little charismatic smile yeah and i love you could you hate him from the moment you meet him in this movie where he's like hey i know i work for the company but i'm really a nice guy I'm yeah. like, red flags red yeah. flags everywhere All over. white guy saying he's a nice guy when you first meet him not a good sign yeah um it's, it's like it's like someone from a religious group coming over oh we're not a sect of course we know we don't yeah, exactly it's not a cult yeah <laughs> it's our religion yeah uh and He just embodies the spinelessness of capitalism so well, how it's like, it's a power system that's only powerful if you don't question it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I love that when you get somebody like Ellen Ripley, who's just like, I question everything. You can't trust life, basically. As a Mm -hmm. woman, you're already kind of built to just go, no, no, I'm I'm kind of protecting myself over here. So your interests don't matter to me. One thing this movie does really well is something that you don't often see in especially action films right now is that you have characters that are je- that are really, really deeply stupid at times. <laughs> Nowadays, yes. you just get quippy people. They might not act smart, but now they might not do smart actions, but they act like they are smart and they're quippy. Right. Smartest guy in the room type of stuff. And they're all knowing and they're all, oh, this is a kind of ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And these yeah. are way more like, they just dare to be stupid, basically. Like Burke, for instance, when he's faced with all this big battle scene with the Marines shooting at the aliens... And he flees away and he locks the door and Ripley can't get through. Mm-hmm. He's just being a coward and trying to save himself, even though he's running away from the people who might be able to protect him. Yes. And also when he's trying to infect Ripley with an alien, he's sort of the oh, only one God. who has more knowledge about the, the, the xenomorph and the stuff going on there. He's trying to eradicate her. Because also because she would expose him, He's, she has. Uh, yeah. But she's also probably the only one who can get him off the planet. And if he would even stop to think for a bit, then he would never do those things. So it is sort of in character with someone who's being really stupid, which I admire. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a weird thing. So it struck me while I was watching the movie, like you wouldn't have that in movies these days. And then I, I stopped to think about it, and I thought, no, actually, that's quite a good thing. Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, depending on the film, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, for, and I guess for me, this being an alien film, I don't mind that there are super characters. Yeah. What I hated to a certain extent was just the fact that you have Ellen Ripley around the dumbest characters ever. Yeah. And it didn't feel to me like we have Ellen Ripley presented as someone who is just naturally grounded and smart the way she is in the first film. Because, hmm. you know, you have a mix of characters in the, in the original, right? You have... Yeah. She's not the only one who's pretty, you know, street smart and stuff. You have a Parker as well, who also mm-hmm. says, like, they don't pay me to be picking up crap like this. I, I, are we going to get overpay or severance? What the hell? You know, yeah. like, how about we just don't do it? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, exactly. And she's trying to hit protocol and stuff. And then the rest are not stupid so much as they are too smart. You know, they're so inquisitive that they want to actually, you know, help their friend and, and everything. So the, the mm-hmm. actions make sense. I don't mind her being around stupid people, but then she just kind of is perfect at everything. Yeah. She can run the the whole exoskeleton suit because she looked at it once. Uh, she learns how oh. to use these very advanced guns really fast well, she, as well. She, um, uh, did you see the director's cut? I'm not sure if it's in the not in the director's cut. Uh, but I 
Did not for this one because I wasn't too sure if we were going to discuss specifically the director's cut or no, the theatrical I, I, version. I, I, so I'm, I'm not sure if this is a difference between the two or not, but I did mm-hmm. watch the director's cut last uh, uh, two days ago. Mm-hmm. And in that, there's this line where she says that she's been working in storage. Sure, uh, as, sure. So she probably learned to use one of those machines there. Ah, and that will get... Then I'll get to another point later that, that that's why I feel the way I do about this. Because I, I yeah. do agree with you that, that they try to explain that away really well. I just caught a detail that I was like, oh. Mm. But that, uh, yeah. again, that's, that's a detail of a bigger thing that is in there that she's perfect at yeah. everything. Yeah, exactly. With her, and the big one was when this is where I just felt they kind of wrote her to be, I'm sorry, Ellen Ripley's just special and way smarter, where I kind of felt like, well, I think any grounded character would have been really able to outsmart most of these people which would <laughs> would have been fine i didn't need ripley to be a genius so when she's telling them all of burke's plans and stuff when he has shown no signs of any of this throughout the whole film yeah. she's just going like well i know capitalists and this is kind of what they do yeah but she just says he's going to do this he was going to do that he was going to do this and he was going to do that yeah she was i was with her when she was explaining she he was trying to impregnate us so that he could get his bioweapon and take it home. I'm like, yes, yeah. that, you know, you have experienced this before, Ripley. You know that. Yeah. When you're trying to go into like, oh, the sleeping pods were going to be hijacked and broken and only a few people were going to survive. And like, yeah. Well, now you're just making up a plot. Yeah. And, and he, to you're, you're make saying sense. He, he, he's a murderer, a mass murderer. Yeah. Without any yeah. signs. No signs. Burke is just a spindly little asshole, and you think that he's capable of thinking that far ahead. I really think the man was just like, there's an alien in here. You're in there. Problem solved. I think yeah. that beyond that, he is not that smart. <laughs> Maybe you'll figure it out later, but he's definitely yeah. not thought that far ahead, judging from locking people out of this <laughs> shit and stuff like and that. locking himself in a closet with a xenomorph as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do agree with you. I do like the stupidity of the characters. And I, I it was really only Ripley's writing in certain instances in that case that she didn't need to be so ahead of the curve because you did make wonderful, dumb, dumb beefcake characters who were just there to shoot things yeah. and get killed. I'm like, well, then yeah, this is great. I loved like My mind is racing to, to, to several places that I wrote down. So all right. I'm trying to get to all of them. But... Um, okay. The thing where Ripley is better at other people, my favorite bit of that is at uh, where they're standing with the motion detector and the mm-hmm. doctor goes, that's in the room and stuff like that. And uh, <laughs> at some point, uh, uh, I think Ripley says, we missed something. And then Hicks yells, yes, back, we didn't miss anything. Or just, no, we didn't miss anything. And then. She looks up instead of they've mentioned that they could be below, but n- not up yet. And that is such a wonderful moment. But she's the first yes. one to go, just like, huh? and <laughs> have we at- considered above us? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, I I don't know if I, uh, I would watch it now for the first time if I wouldn't just think this is so stupid. Obviously, like, <laughs> above you instead of below you. What what, what do you th- what are you thinking right now? The only thing that made sense to me for that, and I guess why I, I didn't even catch it, but now you mentioned it, it is hilariously just like plot armored. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just the fact they did go into the air ducts in the first film. So oh, yeah. I can imagine her thinking like, well, where would the air ducts be? Yeah. Ah, shit. And then you kind of look upward. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. They don't really give us enough of what Ellen's like thinking throughout most of the film. She just yeah. like exposition correctness every now and then there are loads of those little things that are when you're looking at the story point they're basically really stupid but they do lead to things that are good about the movie that are really good about the movie Mm -hmm. that i think uh, cameron really handles well as tension within a scene and one of those things is the motion detector itself because what the fuck does that thing detect i can't say does it detect no. like like movements in the air or something like it can look into another room and see yeah. motion there, but it does work as a visual thing. Like they're coming towards us, but we can't see it. So for that is a, a huge payoff. And you know, it's just them building up this is where they did do sequel work, right? You know, that the, you have this in the original Alien. When they're doing that scene in the air ducts, they use a motion detector as well, which is also one of those ridiculous, like, why is it just like 
how is it only picking up this alien when you're in an air duct? But okay. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they're just like, make it bigger. And yeah. so they made a more advanced one. And that the makes one it, detail makes it, that makes, it, makes it stupider, I think. Because in the air ducts, I can sort of, then I can sort of guess like, yeah, it's probably air movement because that sort of makes sense in an air duct. But now right. it's in another room where you think, how the fuck is it working? Yeah, what is it picking up? Is yeah. it like based on sound? Because there's a lot of like steam and stuff going off throughout yeah, this does, entire facility. Does it pick up water falling down or something like that, mm-hmm. like a drip? It does pick and up they also mice. have like little shapes as yeah. if they're like, they're not humans. They're just weird blobbly shapes that like, apparently this thing can pick up the fact that they're not shaped correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that also strikes me that sort of makes it stupider, but is also perfect for the movie it is. Is the title Aliens? Yeah. Aliens, <laughs> because there's well the 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 famous uh, two thing about the pitches for the movies was Alien is Jaws in space, uh-huh. and then James Cameron supposedly pitched this movie and he wrote on the board the word Alien and then he did an S behind that like wow, <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. wow, wow, mind Whoa. blown stuff like that innovation. But, it's, no, it's an interesting thing, and then he puts su- such a big shitload of aliens in there that's, that makes it interesting, especially, especially for the movie it is. But also really fits the movie in tone and stuff like that, because Alien, you can see that as there's one there's an alien, but also it is alien, like the, the existential yeah. stuff that comes along with it. The, the stuff, But Aliens really makes it a, a concretization of just the things that are going about, like it's a very mm-hmm. palpable terror now. And that is what the movie is. So it sort of takes away with all the doom feeling of the previous movie. Yeah. But the movie itself does that too. It does. It really does. Hmm. It's got a tone that's very lighthearted. And um, it, it, it seems to, like, I don't know if Die Hard came out before or after this movie, but it, has the same kind of DNA to it, you know. You're not supposed to overthink this film. You're supposed to just go like, shoot him, die, don't get the acid on you. You know. I'm sort of, I'm sort of uh, sure that it came out after because I think that Die Hard was after Predator, wasn't it? Oh, well, Predator was '87. Yeah. Um. So let's see. I'm looking it up right now. Die Hard was '88. You're right. It did come yeah. out after Predator. Which yeah. oh wow. So Predator was more of a blueprint for Die Hard than the other way around. That's interesting to me. Yeah. And then Aliens. Well, '86. Yeah. Be- okay. I-, I looked that up myself because I was thinking with the uh, the way the Marines are portrayed in Aliens, it sort of has a similar feel to the way they're being portrayed in Predator, where it's mm-hmm. sort of a satirization of even these big. Um, uh, Marines, these real uh, muscular men who you can see uh, in any action movie like Commando and stuff like that. Anything uh-huh. that, that was thought up in a wave of cocaine, those guys, <laughs> they're being put up against a monster that they can't fight. And this is an element of that as well. Only in, in, in Predator, it's more like a sort of an almost a satire thing. Like it's, t- yeah. it's taking those guys and it makes them into the the girls in the sorority house where a killer is roaming free <laughs> with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as the final girl. And here it sort of has a similar feeling to it, except that uh, um, especially like a, a guy like uh, Hudson, mm-hmm. Bill Paxton, who's a really obnoxious dude. Oh, yeah. Game over, man. Game over. <laughs> but then I do think that they fall on just on the other side of a very thin line where aliens, those characters are way more meant to be just fun characters and they are the muscly over masculine stuff. But I do think that Cameron thought that they belonged there in such an action movie and not put into an alien movie. Yes, to put it exactly. That way. And That's even though probably... you kind of hate Hudson, this is very much the way that Cameron feels action movies should be. Also, judging from the fact simply that he also wrote Rambo 2. Uh-huh. 
That's the thing that drove it to, <laughs> drove it home for me. Like the thought, like, is this satire? Satir-? No, it isn't because he probably no. thinks it should be the way. This is where we're getting into one of my fundamental complaints for the film. Okay, besides the fact that I just wanted. A, at least a base continuation of the original movie. Yeah. Again, I don't care if you change the genre and the tone as long as you just pay attention to the the lore that you've set up and use it in some way, which they just ignored it. Mm-hmm. But then if you then take just the fact that I just don't think I like the way Cameron makes an action movie outside of his Terminator movies. Mm-hmm. Because that whole franchise, for one, he made the two movies themselves. So yeah. the continuity is very strong between one and two for the Terminator yeah. films. And because it's an original property, you can have whatever tone you want to. It works. But with Aliens, it just kind of felt like I have a generic idea with one really core human element that's in my mind that I want to explore in this film. Mm -hmm. And then he just... His, his, in my opinion, his bad taste is just thrown at it. Of Like, as you say, there's a sincerity of him being like... But Hudson is an action hero. I'm like, oh, yeah. God. Oh, oh, Jim. Like, <laughs> Why is everybody like this? Because it's not a satire. It's not actually trying to poke fun. It really is just like, but isn't this fun? I'm like, I guess. <laughs> I do know that Bill Paxton wrote, uh, read his role and thought, well, you just can't wait for this guy to die. <laughs> right. So he, was, he knew Paxton. what he was getting into. Oh, and, yeah. I... I Everybody in the cast did. That's another big plus for the film is yeah. that despite my grievances, everyone brought their A-game in this movie. Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> and Paxton, I, I thought, well, I, I don't think his character is as funny as he, he tries to be. No. But Sad. there are some some moments where he gets quite vulnerable. And I don't mean the the game over, man, but just before that, when realization is dawning on him that he might not get yeah. out of this, where mm-hmm. you just see that shift in his eyes where he's really acting that you see, yeah, there's, there's the Paxton I like. There's the Paxton when- from True Lies, which is my favorite cooperation of his with uh, James Cameron. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like the whole moment when they get into the facility and he's just having a panic attack and the Ripley's like, I have a task for you just to yeah. distract him. Like, yeah. you need to calm down. We yeah. don't have a lot of time. And I love how he's just like, I will do this. Yeah. Because <laughs> he knows he needs to do it for himself. Yeah. And I'm like, there you go, Bill. Go go, yeah. go get those plans. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, thumb wrestlers. I think it's an amazing bit of timing. It's sort of explained in the director's cut. But that Ripley comes back from being frozen and immediately after that, the xenomorphs are back as well. I'm so happy you brought this up because I was complaining about this all night last night. I was like, well, good for them, huh? That this shit happened when they happened to find this woman who was going to not be found. But it's (laughs) also sort of explained that Burke has sent people out to the ship. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the director's cut or not. That might be the director's cut. No, 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 it's not. They have been there uh, for 20 years and they haven't discovered this ship. That's sort of weird. That's the thing. And that's what bothered me. It's like, look, I, yeah, they, it's in the theatrical cut that he sent the colony there because they were trying to create their bioweapon and get xenomorphs created. But it took a damn long time before those eggs were found, basically, <laughs> yeah. unless that facility has just been, you know, ravaged for way longer and they just started to fake you know, communications or something, but that's not in the movie. So I can't, you know, this is me just trying to make excuses for a lack of information. Basically. Mm -hmm. Um, If we go on face value, then yeah, it's like for 20 years, it was fine. And then just lo and behold, everyone's dead. And Hey, thank goodness we have a Ripley. (laughs) (laughs) But that never occurred to me before that this was an alien species that doesn't have air travel. I always thought, well, they might be parasites and live with that sort of thing. As much, but they get to places because otherwise, how would they get to species? I never thought of, well, oh, yeah, they find them in a ship with another being yeah. there that has had the chest buster. So it's it's a weird thing that I never thought of. That. Yeah, it takes you having to go, oh, what's this? And then getting yeah. a face hugger on your face for it to really start to kick off. Yeah, it sort of felt more like the Starship Troopers thing where you have uh, yes. bugs that spread. And you just don't know how they're getting from one planet to the next because I can can they survive in space? Maybe that's also something that's interesting that's not addressed in either film because in both films, 
you have uh, Ripley. This is another grievance I had. You kill your big bad the same way you killed her in the previous movie. Yeah. Of just going, get out of here, and then kicking it out <laughs> of the airlock. Yeah. Big difference, though. The first film uses the thrusters of the escape pod to just burn up the mm-hmm. alien as well. So we yeah. don't know. We don't know if it's going to be floating around just kind of angry for a long time. Uh, and I'm very curious if that queen alien is just like, well, crap. <laughs> and then waiting to fall on top of something. <laughs> One thing I do admire from James Cameron when he's not touching other people's properties mm-hmm. is I do love a good exploration of tropes. Yeah. And that's probably where this movie is like – a grievance for me is that I felt that the first one did such a good job of exploring themes and feelings that are common in horror and in science fiction in with characters and story. Hmm. But the tropes tended to be only there for specific plot elements. Like you, you have to do enough to create the conflict yeah. And then from there, you just kind of have to deal with something that is bigger than you. So we don't have to do the slasher thing of, well, you're dumb and this is why you die. Instead, it was just more like, were you ever going to survive in the first place kind of a yeah. thing? Whereas in Aliens, it's, it's Cameron's going like, hey, I'm making it. You could tell he had a script that was an action film. Mm-hmm. He wanted to explore tropes. He wanted to do all these things. And for that, he does a good job with that. He's always good at tropes. Yeah. Um, and... There's something about celebrating the genres that you're putting on screen and understanding that and doing that. I mean, look, he did Piranha 2 as well, which is a great <laughs> yeah. you know, way for him to look at like eco horror and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, like this is a nice tropey film. And I think if it had honestly just gone a little harder into Predator territory and been a satire, it would have yeah. been one of my favorites in the entire franchise. <laughs> but it, because of that sincerity of like, I just like tropes. I don't know what to think anymore. My brain is like dragged in two different directions the whole time. (laughs) It's it's a difficult point to make because uh, Predator was also in the 80s. So that kind of spits my my thing in the face. But I do think that (laughs) as a product of the 80s, it might be a bit too much to ask for that, especially in... uh, in a movie that turns a very great film into a franchise. Fair, yeah. But I mean, you can keep in mind, Predator, it almost feels like Predator looked at aliens and was like, you could still explore the very serious emotions. So they explored like, you know, the camaraderie and brotherhood that these these men share with each other and, and sensitive yeah. male bonding, basically, yeah. amongst very insensitive men. <laughs> uh, and... As you said, I love the final girl, Arnold mm-hmm. fucking Schwarzenegger in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they do that is a cool exploration. And then they're just like, but let's just show all this like her. Yeah. Sweaty man meat stuff. That's hilarious throughout this film yeah. and really feeds into who they are as people later in the film. Mm-hmm. And only Ellen really gets that treatment in Aliens, which is fine. I, yeah. I mean, again. Terminator is a great example of this. Mm-hmm. I mean, little Ham- Linda Hamilton's character well, in that, just yeah, yeah, Sarah Connor is the perfect example of like I am the only one who gets a story arc and I'm a badass. And we're like, I I agree, it's fine. Yeah, well, Hicks gets a bit well, not a story arc, but at least he's there to recognize her for what she is. And yeah, he's a nice guy. Yeah, and he's sort of the smartest one of the Marines. And I like that he's also uh, one of the only men who shows his insecurities. In Mm -hmm. a natural way, like, you know, you have Hudson, who is just toxic and then breaks down at the moment things are inconvenient. (laughs) Whereas you have Hicks, who is indeed well-trained, he means well, but his insecurities come from, like, when they're like, oh, you're a corporal now. And the look on his face when he's like, oh, God, you're right. Like, I'm in control (laughs) and I never wanted this. (laughs) I liked Hicks's development in this film. And, you know, it's it's a Cameron go-to guy with Michael Bien, or Bean, Bean, is that what he said his name? Bean? I think so. I don't know. I'm going for Bean Michael. because I like him being Mr. Bean. <laughs> Mr. Bean? <laughs> Michael Bean, then. Yeah. Lance Henriksen, before getting the part of Bishop, he was thinking maybe he should stop his acting career because it Are wasn't really getting in very well. me? And really? this is the one that he thought, well, if this doesn't work out, if this doesn't become a good thing, then I might quit oh, acting. Oh, wow. Lance, 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 I'm so happy you did this movie then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the amazing work we've gotten from him since. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And it wasn't even like, I'm I'm happy that he got the role and he was happy with it. Even then, they didn't give him as much to work with as he's capable of. No, that's true. He does. Yeah. He does do the creepy bit very well. Like having yeah. you guess, like he's not he's not entirely human, and it sort of does feed into the angst created by the first one. Mm-hmm. But I do he's exploring the uh, the face hugger. I love yeah. how she's he's like I'm gonna go back to my specimen. She's like yeah you do that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's being a real dick to uh, Bishop for most of the movie. Oh yeah, she's a huge racist in this movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and and she commits a genocide. But that's she a whole different thing. <laughs> But also, at the end of the movie, right, I sort of get that she would warm to Bishop after uh, saving Newt, who yes. she's emotionally so connected to at that point. Like, that would yeah. be the thing that redeems him. But she's also she's already kind of warmed to him just before that. And the scene leading up to uh-huh. that part where the Queen is comes back and... So that kind of threw me off. Like I wouldn't have uh, been surprised if she would still have been a dick to him at the end of that. It would have been interesting. Like hesitation to get on that ship because it's like, are you taking me back to a facility or are yeah. you saving me from this alien? Yeah. And why are you saving me from this alien? Exactly. Yeah. With the yeah. suspicions, I would have guessed that because before that, she still finds every excuse to hate on him instead of... Just thinking, well, maybe there's a reason he isn't here. Just go, oh, fucking Bishop, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we get those kind of action movie inconsistencies, right? Because, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of tropey action films just rely on you following point A to point B to point C. And if anybody acts a little differently because we really needed to end the movie now, mm-hmm. just accept the fact that it had a happy ending and you can go home. <laughs> <laughs> it's 106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. I do wonder why so, uh, some people do say <clears throat> that this that this sequel is better than the original, which is taste. You know, they just taste. like action movies probably more than they like existential horror. And yeah. I'm not going to fault anybody for that. No. The one thing I just wish people would understand and, and, and try to realize from people from my perspective is it is a sequel. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you can like it more. That's OK. But don't say that it's doing some like... Don't act as if it is rebooting a franchise, basically, and that everything that follows should be the logic of a sequel. Mm-hmm. Uh, when that happens, franchises go off kilter. And Alien, it's funny, Alien has that reputation as being the Aliens franchise. Yeah. But it really is Aliens and the yeah. Aliens versus Predator movies. The rest of them <laughs> try to do Ridley Scott's movie. <laughs> yeah, very much so, yeah. Even Resurrection tries. Yeah. But they're still stuck with some of the ideas that that Cameron introduced, like an alien. Queen. Yeah, they're listening to it, but they can't. Yeah, they can't hardly move away from it. They they do need to incorporate the bit of the Queen in there, because otherwise exactly. it's not. They're really bad sequels then too. So uh, of, uh, of three and four, do you like them better in many ways than two? Or okay, <laughs> this is where I get into hot take territory. Yeah. I think Alien Resurrection did a better job with what this movie was trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not as good as a movie. That's the hard thing. to like, That's why it's so hard to say. Like, yeah. All of the flaws Alien Resurrection has, I think Aliens also has. It's just yeah. that Aliens has a better cast doing it. Yeah. And a stronger, like a stronger effects and writing team behind it. Mm-hmm. But at the very least... It explains the presence of the multitude of aliens and the designs and the reasons why they do the things they do in such a way of adhering to this biogenetic weaponry kind of thing. It's really showing like, okay, the corporation got their way. Mm -hmm. They're now starting to experiment on these things. Yeah. And they have a facility. Yeah. And that's where I'm like, if aliens had done, done something to that effect, I wouldn't have minded this whole dumb, mindless bug thing that they yeah. did. Because I even said to my partner last night, there's one thing that would have made me go, I accept all of this really, really well. And that's if they had shown some sort of indigenous bug that had a chest burster pop out of it. 
Hmm. Because then it would have explained why they act like bees in a hive and stuff when clearly they didn't in the original film. It was far more Hmm. like a parasite that just recreates itself inside of a host. And And it was just like, hey, they're laying eggs. This Other, must be a queen laying yeah, eggs then. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> ants, ants do eggs. Maybe we can make that a thing. But it's exactly. also just a way to get a bigger threat in there because you have to top the original, yeah. which is tropey sequel territory. Well, you do have to top your original somehow. And yeah. I you know, I think that's the failure of the later two films is that they mm-hmm. don't really in any, you know, profound way. Uh, other than Ripley, you know, nails that basketball shot in uh, Resurrection. <laughs> so like that, that, I guess that tops all, all four of them. But uh, <laughs> but for me, Alien 3 is my favorite of the sequels. Okay. Obviously, only the assembly cut. I'm not talking about the, the theatrical cut because that mm-hmm. is just, a, that's not a film, <laughs> basically. That's just I haven't a seen the of theatrical club cut. I've only seen the assembly Don't. cut. Don't. But point being, those, those two sequels, uh, for me... I find them more enjoyable overall. I think Aliens is a really good popcorn movie. And if I have friends over and they love it and they want to watch it, that's fine. They just need to accept the fact I'm probably going to whip out my phone and laugh at the moments that are appropriate. (laughs) Uh, And if they say something that they enjoy, I'll be like, yeah, I I, sure. That's cool. I agree with you. But I'm not going to be there as invested as they are in this movie. That's that's cool as well, I think. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I sort of have a weak spot for Resurrections as well as the the visual things that Jeunet is trying to uh, do in there, yeah. and that's the one that got him kicked out of Hollywood, and then he got to make Emily, <laughs> and that is fine as well. Yeah, he got to do stuff. You know, in a way, it's also a blessing that he got kicked out of Hollywood because he got to make movies that he really, really wanted to make. Cameron was warned by I think a producer was also on Taxi Driver. Who uh, told him? Well, if you're if you're going to make a movie and people don't like it, they're going to say all the bits that are good. Yeah, that's thanks to the original and uh, all the things that they don't like. They'll put on you, which is kind of what's happening right now. It is what's <laughs> happening. It is what's happening. And Cameron uh, gave gave uh, the reply. Yeah, but it will be cool. Ah, <laughs> that that is James Cameron. Yeah, that is it. That is the man that I. I have this love-hate relationship with. Yeah. How? And here's the thing. This is where I come back to fans. Yeah. James Cameron. I'm sorry, fans. I'm going to say something controversial right now. <laughs> yeah. James Cameron is just a slightly more focused Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that comparison is excellent. <laughs> yeah. But because like it also completely like... explains why I can sometimes swing with Cameron and almost never with Michael Bay. Michael Bay is just throwing ideas out yeah. and not getting, he's not listening to his producers who are like, maybe yeah. you should like do one idea, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at least, at least Cameron likes telling a story. Yes. He is yeah. a story guy. I appreciate that. Yeah. But he is not a Steven Spielberg. No. He's not a Ridley Scott. No. And he, he's always mentioned in the same ilk because he's made a, maybe one or two movies that were at that caliber. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, he doesn't care to make those movies. No, I do think and that a lot of his reputation comes from the uh, same thing that gives Michael Bay the attitude that he has. And that is, he has made some of the most profitable movies ever. So yeah. that also gives him a seat at the table. Even though he is clearly talented at some things, but the the amount of money that his movies have made is something that is very important. Also, movies that people thought were going to fail, like Titanic, like Avatar, and then you put mm-hmm. them out, and then huge bank. The biggest movies ever made, yeah. Exactly, like that. But Michael Bay also has his attitude, like when he did, I think it was Transformers 2, and people were really uh, giving him crap for the way the movie turned out. And he said, well, it still made that that much money, so there must be something good about it. Yeah, That's where we get into the journalism sector, too. I think a lot of critics get into this headspace of believing that 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 is what film criticism is is like but it's a got it's a box office hit so you can't deny that it's an amazing movie yeah and uh, me as an esthetician and a and you know film like theorist <laughs> uh, i'm like um quality and success are very different things yeah and also to say that something lacks quality doesn't mean that you have a you know, a poor mind if you enjoy it either. Because, no. like, I love plenty of th- movies that aren't 
high quality. I just, I like them. You yeah. know, that's just how it is. Mm-hmm. But I at least admit it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, by the time Aliens came around, it wasn't such a big thing yet. But the the whole, the bitch, get your hands okay. over, you bitch. Every time that you, you dislike anything that is female, just going with the word bitch. Mm-hmm. It has become yeah. something that I, it's become a trope in itself. That line is so popular. Yeah. And it's one of the things I hate the most in the movie because it is one of the laziest moments in the movie Yeah, because it is Jaws copied and pasted. It's, you know, eat this, you son of a bitch. Get yeah. your hands off of her, you bitch. And the the heart and soul of this film, yeah. the driving force that makes this so watchable for me is Sigourney Weaver. Mm-hmm. Her performance in this film yeah. is perfect. Mm-hmm. There's not a misstep she handles all of these grievances that we've mentioned, all of these little writing issues, and yeah. she just steps over plot holes. She doesn't care. Yeah. She's just going to own it. Yeah. So that delivery, I think that's why people love it, is because the anger, the venom in that voice of like, let yeah. go of my daughter, <laughs> is so good. But I agree with you that it is such a, oh, I get it. It's a queen. It's a female yeah. organism. Mother that. against mother. Yeah. Yeah. Feminism in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> when Wonder Woman came out, I think it was James Cameron who uh, sort of railed against the whole feminism plotline surrounding the narrative in the media by going, "Well, we did a female action hero in the eighties, but they did have to give her the excuse of of motherhood feelings to make that work." They thought, it's like, well, yeah. I mean, do we want to get on that yet or not? Or, yeah, go are, on. Are, are we at Newt yet? <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's, okay. let's, let's go Newt. Let's go so, Newt. one uh, positive oof. note before we get in here. Yeah. And I want to say about to... Newt is that it's an yes. excellent casting based on looks alone. The way she looks. Magnetic. Yes. Yeah. She is one of the most photogenic, like, child actors I've ever seen. Yeah. She looks good in every shot. Yeah. She fits this frail but kind of orphan-like character. There are even moments that, you know, we were just like making references to like Oliver Twist and stuff. Like, can I have some more? You know? Yeah. <laughs> She's got that street urchin thing about her. The casting for it is really well done. Performance. Is Newt English or not? I don't know. Um, there's Originally, there's some, yes. I was going to say, the actress seems to definitely be English, but I think that Cameron oh. tried desperately no, she, she has American parents, but she okay. She's been living in England for a f- couple of years there, so there are a couple ah. of line deliveries that sound slightly British. Yeah, anytime she has a line that's not just like one word, it kind of mm. bleeds through just a little bit. Look, when it comes to Newt, performance-wise, ah, whatever. Kid acting is a tough thing. I'm mm-hmm. not going to ever really pick that apart too much. No. I'm more about the writing here. Yeah. And it just feels to me like this movie did not need to have a child in it. I feel that it is kind of insulting to your audience to assume that you need to have a child in a film to make tension happen. <laughs> uh, and the I think my partner and I figured out the moment that, oh, this is why you actually wanted Newt. And I don't think it actually serves this uh, maternal storyline that's in there. I, in fact, it almost felt like the maternal storyline was there to make Newt work. Mm-hmm. And therefore make Ripley have a really good story arc, which is fine. I, I, you know, I do like that stuff and it's done well, even if it mm-hmm. seems like an afterthought to me. Yeah. It's just that you have the moment where they're in the air ducts and Newt knows it by heart. Yeah. And that's my, this is why they have a child right there. Somebody who is small, who can crawl through these air ducts and know it really well and survive. Yeah. And then you kind of like retroactively figure out how do we make this work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mixed with that story that clearly Cameron had some sort of a script lying around of a story arc for a woman who yeah. is going over PTSD and then losing a child. I, Put thought, together, uh, I thought it was more the an alien being with sort of a mother parallel. So the queen idea is mostly from there. I'm not sure if... Uh, Fair. Also, yeah. Yeah, people, uh, I've noticed that reading a lot as well. And I wonder, maybe I'm a cynic. I feel that that's just a, a reading. If, if yeah. I'm honest, like I do think, yeah, you do get the big uh, the mama mama bears at the end of the movie kind of battling it out. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of this comes down to Sigourney Weaver, though, 
and maybe on set decisions. Not to say that James Cameron doesn't see these things and know these things. I just don't yeah. know if it was in the writing process so much as they're on set. Mm-hmm. Ripley has to nuke all of these eggs and do it right in front of the queen. And I can imagine you making that decision of like, you have to be so conflicted while you do this. And yeah. almost apologize to her, but also fuck you. My yeah. species is more important than yours. Yeah. And it's a cool moment, but Newt just feels like a plot device yeah. to give Ripley some sort of motivation. And I think the trauma of the first film was enough. Hmm. I think that that was more than enough to keep yeah, Ripley in- invested in all of this. I do, I do like uh, some of the scenes where you see that chemistry because that sort of works, especially with uh, Sigourney Weaver pulling out at that. Mm-hmm. Those are some really good scenes. But they are. The thing that you were talking about with the fire flamethrower was uh, that that it reminded me most of that scene. By the way, I thought Ripley goes uh, does a genocide and she's going for full bear Jew here from uh, glorious <laughs> bastards. Like <laughs> <laughs> she really does when they're firing uh, firing in the movie theater. That exact yeah exactly the end of the film <laughs> just like shooting Hitler way too many times. <laughs> <laughs> That is how it felt. It was a bit of an overkill situation. It yeah. was like, if you're going to nuke the facility, do you even need to be doing this right now? No, definitely uh, If not. Newt isn't in any danger, why are you so mad? And you sort of, <laughs> they sort of had a truce with the queen where uh, she threatens with a flamethrower. The queen lets the other uh, xenomorphs just go away. She tells them to go away uh-huh. and they sort of go away. So that maybe they could have just walked out of there and nuked it from space. And also, what does that say about Ripley that she goes like, nah, and then she just pisses off this thing <laughs> right in front. It's like, actually, you know, you let me go and you let me take over my foster child, yeah. but I'm going to kill all your kids right yeah. in front of you. <laughs> oh, this, this is vicious. <laughs> I've been the most rational person in this movie so far, but now I feel the hatred. Exactly. And I'm letting go. And, and that's the nuke of it all for me. <laughs> yippee ki motherfucker. I want to say that this movie always gets me for the first like 40 minutes yeah everything until they bring the military in yeah is good it's really it's a good sequel at at those points i love that like oh we're exploring how 57 years later how is Waylon yutani reacting to the situation i love that they're like so you blew up our ship decades ago and they're still mad about it yeah (laughs) uh all of these and they do they uh owe her 57 years of back pay now that she's turned out to be alive. Or not. Yeah, you know, they she never has to work actually... in a, somewhere in a storage facility somewhere. So probably she yeah. hasn't gotten paid for that. There you go. And they only address, well, we're not charging you money for something that you owe us. But like, wouldn't 57 years of work pay for all the damages that, you know, maybe her medical problems and trauma and stuff as yeah. well. I think you owe her quite a bit more than she owes yeah. you for one ship. Yeah. And it showed their priorities, which is good. That's good horror storytelling because it's like yeah. the only reason you're upset is because the alien was on board. Mm-hmm. Um, so I loved all of that. I loved the build up to it. I even loved like, you know, they go to her to tell her that something's going on with the facility and she just slams the door in their face. Yeah. All of that was cool. But there are just things about it like maybe we'll get into the improvements then after that because there, I was already thinking about ways. I'm like this sequel tonally could have been this way, but there were certain like – approaches you could have taken that i think it would have made it a more interesting film to me i do do sort of like that it's also become sort of its own thing quite quickly like yeah. the logo also already says it's a different type and different way to put it in the screen it's not like the, to, the letters appearing and then an s behind it mm-hmm. something like that it's, it's just a new font that says this is its own thing and lots and of that bang. is connected to that also the fact that she gets dragged to that hearing and here's what she gets to hear like uh yeah um thank you but no thank you you can fuck off with the uh, stuff you've done to us and uh you're now at your biggest lowest depth since yeah. being confronted with an alien fuck <laughs> you which is your most recent memory, by the way. She hasn't had yeah. 57 years to process it. Exactly. She's had five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Even though in the end of the movie, she she says, um, yeah, we can dream uh, to Newt. Which is just the thing. She knows. She has been asleep for 57 years. She probably knows that she doesn't dream. She's just the way she was when she went to sleep. Yeah. And also, yeah, the whole... Oh, don't even get me started on the ending. Like, this big happy ending, whereas, like... 
So you went from the worst trauma and horrifying experience of your life, the scariest thing you've ever experienced. Then you get gaslit into thinking that was all your fault and you should have done it differently. And then they hire you to go to an even more traumatic and devastating experience yeah. that you happen to survive just from your own sheer, sheer willpower. And you don't just like collapse at the yeah. end of all of this. No, I need a nap. No, it made a process the first one. That's that's. Oh, um, that's what happened. That, okay. That's what psychology is. It's, it was a big, big uh, thing of exposure therapy. I see. I see. Maybe it's seeing that, you know, that they're actually just mindless bugs made yeah. it a lot less scary for her than that, for that first uh, experience. I did ha I did have that thing of where she, she walks into the facility and it's it's a bigger moment in the, the, the uh, director's cut. I looked that up where in the director's cut, she does hesitate before walking into the, uh, the colony. Right. Well, in the original, she just walks in. Yeah. A bit is cut out where she's standing in front and hmm, someone says, what's wrong? And she thinks better of it and just goes in. So there's no hesitation uh. in, the, in the original where you just <clears throat> think, why would she even go in there? Because she has been told that she does not have to go to where the action is. She could have gone right. back to the ship. Fair. That's a fair or point. Stayed in the shuttle and died maybe, but they probably wouldn't have even gotten the shuttle to fly back if she wouldn't have been there. They wouldn't have had a xenomorph get on board if she had stayed. No. <laughs> so... I uh, might have actually had the escape plan if uh, Ripley yeah. had just stayed on the ship. Yeah. And if and if Burke would have gone in and he and all the Marines died because of the Xenomorphs without any direction from Ripley, then they could have nuked it from orbit and just gotten out of there. Short situation right there. <laughs> this is, this but is then turning it's not into, a movie. Now, this is turning into <laughs> an episode of how it should have ended. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> unless it's part of your improvements. Improvement does you. Uh, my improvements actually have more with the setup. Because mm -hmm. I don't mind that all this convoluted stuff happens uh, and people do dumb mistakes and stuff. Mm -hmm. The only things that I really minded were adhere to the aesthetics of the previous film Mm -hmm. You know, you're giving me gloop and glop and, and insect imagery that wasn't in the original. Mm -hmm. Unless you see the director's cut, there is some gloopiness, but that's mm -hmm. that's another big grievance. I would not have had a queen alien in here. I would have adhered no. to they are kind of like asexual replicating creatures that through mucus like break down your genetic yeah. you know, DNA and make you into an egg. Knowing that yeah. the eggs are people just yeah. freaked me out in the first movie. <laughs> And I think they should have kept to that in this movie. Just, With just the, enough horror, you know? Yeah. And keep the, the sexual implications of all the terrible stuff uh, yes. intact. Yes. I, I wanted to see a little bit more of, like, the penetration and stuff of these big, beefy soldiers. It would yeah. have been a nice little allegory there. The rapiness. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> the very, very least, the viciousness of it all. Yeah. Uh, but, okay. So, for me, I think that Alien 3, despite the whole prison and over philosophy and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, the setup of it that I really enjoy was the fact that they decided to see what the xenomorph would be like from an entity that's not human. Mm -hmm. And I think you could have done a wonderful red herring in this film where you start out pretty much exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, her and Jonesy are taken out of the cryostasis. Everything's fine, whatever. And... Uh, the whole colony thing was already, like, we've already mentioned, like, they're 20 years there, and then suddenly they just have a problem? No. Mm. What if they were on a colony? You know, it's 57 years in the future. Maybe Earth is already obsolete. Yeah. You're on some sort of colony. Doesn't have to be L LV426. Uh, uh, I yeah. think just anywhere is fine. Yeah. But there's a moment in the original Alien. This is where I'm like, sequels need to pay attention to what came before, because yeah. there's a moment they don't know where Jones is. Yeah. Who's to say that Jones didn't actually get infected by something? Because we, if you go by the director's cut, it's creating eggs. Yeah. So it would have been so amazing if they would have found, like, a face hugger in the pod. Yeah. And you don't have anything. But because they went in cryostasis, you already have an embryo that's been frozen this whole time. Yeah. So the thing is, when they come to her, they're like, there's something wrong with your cat. Yeah. And we don't have to see a traumatic scene of a cat exploding or anything like that. It could just be that when they go there, there's just blood all over the walls. Yeah. Um, and that's where it starts. That you yeah. have one alien that's like this tiny cat alien thing yeah. that then all it needs is to get one person. 
Yeah. And you start taking down all of the people from Weyland Yutani. If you want to do your big anti capitalist story, you make the capitalists turn into the xenomorphs who start <laughs> infesting this entire colony mm. one by one. And yeah. there, from there, you can have Ripley, like, you know, get her shit together. Very dead space kind of thing. Like, you just wake up and you're like, fuck. And yeah. you just kind of, here we go again. Let me push through my trauma and try to get through this. And through ingenuity and engineering and all that, she manages yet again to solve the situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you would end this, but mm -hmm. I just think if you had a setup that if you wanted to have this colony, you wanted it to be people, basically, uh, just like average families and stuff. I think that all of those ideas I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. You could even still have action. You could have had the military come in later if you wanted to do this and yeah, then try you, to save her. But you yeah. wouldn't get the Ridley Scott, let's go to the origin stuff in there, which I no. don't see as necessary, but you would have developed on the terms of the original into a sequel, which exactly. could still have turned into a big thing. Maybe it would have been, exactly. wouldn't have been the big cathartic trauma therapy that Aliens is now, but... Well, you could still have Newt. You could still have yeah, yeah. her telling, you know, for one, you would keep that scene in with her explaining that she had a daughter who just, you know, lived a nice long life while she was in cryostasis. I also mean uh, <laughs> trauma therapy for soldiers like Vietnam. Oh, Sorry. like that. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> only way you could have done that is if indeed, like, they come in and she's like, you don't know what the hell is going on and tries to, like, warn them. And then they just get ambushed. Yeah. And then you can still have, like, that Hudson scene of, like, you need to calm down. We need to yeah. do this. Mm -hmm. It might even help Ripley to kind of like get her head straight too, because somebody has to take the lead, and these soldiers were just too shell shocked to understand the situation. Yeah, this the fact that there is this the, the aliens lacks the unknown to me mm -hmm. because there's one key key point, and this kills the movie for me every single time, and it's so early on, it's such a shame. Mm -hmm. Hudson says, "Is this just another bug hunt, or yeah. what are we doing?" And he says it twice, so it's not like a throwaway line. No. So you are implying that there are other alien races yeah. that you are used to seeing and killing in this, this universe. It, it's but actually almost taken from uh, the book of um, Starship Troopers. Yes. Because it they also does use feel the like word, a Starship Troopers moment. They also use the word drop, which is also clearly lifted from that. That wasn't there used you go. in this context before, but that is what yeah, that refers to. And just about 10 years later, we got a Starship Troopers movie. So yeah. it shows that it was on people's minds. Yeah. But by that was not the universe you wanted to merge with this. Because no. that is schlocky Flash Gordon with a shotgun kind of a movie. You know, it's Doom with bugs. Yeah, it's a movie, but it's <laughs> it's also not entirely what the what the novel is, if I understand correctly. Okay. That's, that's, nice. Yeah, it was, it was very much uh, um, Paul Verhoevenized. <laughs> to give it a which, certain term which, which is, is okay I it think is a good, good thing yeah and that's another thing like you know keep in mind like Cameron is not a Verhoeven and so no. he doesn't do excess very well he doesn't do over the top very well no. he just does enough to get it watchable yeah. most of the well, time yeah. well he does over the top but it is it's on face value it's not it's not that's telling point. you something more if you Fair. if you're looking for that you can you can watch a, a Verhoeven movie on two levels, like enjoy it for the action movie that's presented to you, or see the mm -hmm. the, the second layer on it, where it's also telling you what it says about you for liking action movies. There you go, and I think that's what Aliens really could have benefited from. It would have also stuck with this sort of pathos of the original, how it says a lot about you of what you're afraid of, depending on how you're coming at this movie. Are you afraid yeah. of? the slashery elements of it yeah are you afraid of the how the fuck does this thing work yeah or are you afraid of the fact that you wouldn't even want to live anymore if the universe actually worked this way and you understood yeah. it yeah and then there's capitalism on top of it of course mm -hmm. um and cameron yeah he beat you over the head so it sounds like instead of apart from all the plot things that you just named you would have liked to see paul verhoeven's aliens I really want to see Paul Verhoeven's Aliens now. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. Because, yeah, the, the fundam like, just this this core of it being an action film, like, it's not my favorite take on this franchise, but if you're mm -hmm. going to do it, there are just so many elements of, like, thematically from the first film that yeah. work really well in an action setting. And also, I'm just thinking now that... <sighs> There's a version of an alien sequel that we haven't gotten in recent years. That's Neil Blomkamp's 
Alien Five. Depressing. Yeah. I I do. Th- I'm not on board with all of his work, but I do think there's an ethos to what he's doing and what he 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 wants to make that is way more in line with Paul Verhoeven than uh, James Cameron has the, has tackled this thing. So yeah, that that does get me interested in that again. I was excited for it for that fact because I, I agree with you as well. I don't love everything. Like Chappie wasn't really my thing, but I did appreciate mm. his uh, exploration of consciousness and yeah. what it means to be human. You yeah. know, it's, is it our personalities or is it our biology that makes us human? Yeah. And he did the same thing with uh, District 9. And I think he could have done the same with the ideas that he was presenting for his proposed Alien 5. I love the idea of having Ripley fusing with the the biogenetics of these aliens Mm -hmm. and kind of understanding them, but using them against themselves. Because Mm. if you understand them, then you also understand their motivations and you can disagree with them. I kind of like that. And of course, you do need to go in more of this aliens world for that level Mm. of over the top to kind of click and 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 work because otherwise it's too quiet of a film yeah um but we, yeah when they were saying it's going to carry on from aliens it was like oh, i don't need to see a 30 year old newt i don't need to see old man hicks and all that um <laughs> i'm one of the apologists for alien 3 whereas where you know she wakes up and they're dead yeah and i i i guess i'm a glutton for punishment that kicks me in the gut every single time i'm like man yeah. ellen you just don't have a good life i'm sorry yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. my description of aliens basically is it's i feel like i feel like steven spielberg watched aliens then read jurassic park and said <laughs> i bet you i can do this better with dinosaurs than he did with aliens <laughs> I think that's a very good description. I think it works, yeah. <laughs> that's that's where I'm at. Because even like Jurassic Park, you know, it's got a lot of horror in it. It's got a yeah. lot of action in it. Mm-hmm. But it at the core of it, it has a lot of people going through things. Yeah, Aliens has Ellen Ripley going through things and everybody else is there for her to do that. I like that. I like that description of it. That's good. That's really good. Thank you. So let's end with your three <clears throat> recommendations. Tip one! <laughs> One is thematic to our discussion today, mm-hmm. and there's a film on Netflix that is severely underseen. I know mm-hmm. it's on the Dutch Netflix. I don't know if it is on... I think it's in the United States as well, but I don't know which versions of it have it, but it's Blood Red Sky. Mm-hmm. This, in my opinion, does a better job of exploring tropes. Mm-hmm. It's action tropes, horror tropes, and it also does a really profound drama about motherhood in it yeah okay i won't give too much away about it other than the plot if you were to read the synopsis really just reads as you know you have snakes on a plane it's like vampires on a plane (laughs) but the film plays out like die hard in a plane and then vampires okay But the vampire is a woman who has a child who's trying to suppress being a vampire (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that is where it all goes nuts is that she's trying really hard to suppress her urges. She's trying to pass as human mm-hmm. and get to her. I think they're going to New York. She, yeah. If she can get to New York, she's going to be safe and she can have a good life. Yeah. But while they're on the plane, terrorists take over the flight for yeah. commercial means, just like you have in, in, in Die Hard. They're just like, yeah. where they're trying to, you know, use them. I like, have a hostage situation. Yeah. And one of, just like you have in any good uh, kind of heist kind of film, you have one psychopath who is actually there just to hurt people. Mm-hmm. And because he's causing so much turmoil and problems and killing people left and right just for fun. Uh, and there's too much miscommunication about what the fuck is going on. She's yeah. being put in a situation where the stress is causing her to not hold it together. Yeah. And the she urges oh, are popping up. Yeah. With the and her child keeps getting in, you know, the the crossfire of certain things yeah she just the exploration of her maternal instincts as a human being Mm -hmm. versus her monstrosity as a vampire they explore like who are the real monsters here on top of that it is ballistic in its action sequences (laughs) so it's everything it's all of these things it's everything aliens is described as 
but yeah. it's more modern in its take. Mm-hmm. And I think that it more genuinely, from the moment it was being created and conceived, had the intention to do those things. Yeah. Um, so Blood Red Sky is Blood my Red first Sky. recommendation. Tip two! I'm going to say His House is mm-hmm. another good shout. Uh, if that one came out in 2020. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, not enough people have, unfortunately. But uh, so for anybody who hasn't, just a very brief uh explanation of that one you have some Afri- african uh, refugees who go to the uk mm-hmm. and it explores their trauma from the the you know actual skirmishes and wars and stuff they've had to deal with back home and, yeah. and the abuses and it also shows how immigrants are treated within the uk yeah in, even in by basically, well-meaning people that's mainly the thing, yeah. Like how the integration system is so abusive as a it's, it, it explores systemic issues and helps yeah. you understand the difference between systemic and the ethics of a human being. Yeah. Because all the people who they're working with are frustrated with their own jobs. Yeah. And I, there's a wonderful quote in there where they're complaining about the house and has rats and it, there's a little bit more going on. There's some like yeah. hauntedness going on that they're mm-hmm. trying to get out of. But the, the, as soon as they they leave, you have one of the workers is like. They have a house. I have an apartment. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so if ever you've heard about refugees and, and you've always, you've ever felt like, well, you know, they're getting really nice houses and these, these different areas and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you've ever felt a bit torn about why are they getting better treatment than, than, than I am. This movie explores what actual treatments they get and how much the government actually does help and what little it yeah. does to also how controlled and confined all of that is you don't have yeah. people inspecting your house like every mm-hmm. few days just to make sure you are acting like you belong in that country exactly so yeah uh, I won't say any more because the movie's got a lot of surprises and it's a beautiful film yeah. and and I, I highly suggest it um and um tip three malignant just watch malignant please uh <laughs> i'm gonna do it in in about a week and a half we have a horror movie night planned with nice. uh, the night house and malignant it's going to be cool Woo, what a double feature oh yeah uh, vastly different universes uh, mm-hmm. that's that's excellent so malignant is one of those films that i'm putting out there that i know all the movies i've mentioned are recent but that's because they're probably easier to find on streaming and stuff right now mm-hmm. and with malignant you know it's, it's a very controversial film mm-hmm. and it just shows that i do like the types of movies that aliens is but mm-hmm. they have to do things with at least like certain continuity and and an interest in what they're doing for me yeah. to really buy into it but this is it's just i'm not going to say much if you if, no. if anybody doesn't know much about it don't know anything about it go watch malignant and then make it make up your your mind for yourself <laughs> and so we fought and we battled as we beat each other up both of us tried hard As they say, is the at. Thank you so much again for listening. And also many thanks to Chandler for being available on such short notice to talk with me online about a particularly lovely little movie. Also thanks, many, many, many thanks to my podcast Pim Daddy, Theodor Stein, for hooking us up. Now, is there anything that I can recommend? Anything that's worth your while to fix your glance on for a short amount of time? Of course there is. Um, Recently I saw The Shootist, a film by Don Siegel from 1976, which is the swan song of the late, great John 
Wayne. Now, no matter what you think of his personal politics, he was quite right-wing. There is a lot of humanity in his performance, especially in a movie like this, which can be seen as sort of an Irishman avant la lettre, but only in Western fashion. Another movie that I was really enamoured with is one that's coming out quickly in the Netherlands, which is called After Yang, a film by Kogonada. He started out as a video essayist about movies, and you might know some of his work. For instance, Wes Anderson Centered. Or from his first feature, Columbus, which is also apparently really good. After Yang deals with the grief that all we humans feel when we lose our android. A theme that nicely circles back to Alien 3, the start of it. Spoilers! It has a dynamite performance by Colin Farrell, Irish accent included. And it doesn't even try to hide the fact that it really turns the lens on us human beings, not on the android. Go watch it. It is good. Anyway, that's it for me. This has been presented and edited by me, which is Ruud, the 20ste Eeuwse Vos. And you heard those lovely jingles made by the genius, that is, Roy Gutters. This podcast is supported by a lot of patrons. Well, five of them. Namely... Casey the Great, Nils Timmer, Sina Martijn, Martijn van Kolwijk, and Ed Huisman. All lovely people. Do you want to be a lovely person as well? Then quickly go to patreon.com slash and find out how to do it. You can also find us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Letterboxd. And if you want to complain, which you may, I invite you to, you can send an email to duimpjewurstelen at gmail.com. Thank you in advance. And see you again in a week or two. Okay, bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, could we have an enormous round of applause, please, for our host, who has once again succeeded in bringing to us a plethora of top-notch, cinematographically-themed entertainment. We have had an absolute ball, have we not? This podcast employs a strict only like and subscribe if you really want to. Pause it. Okay, bye.